This is how it all starts, a huge empty building, not an antique or collectible in sight. Regardless of the city, when the staff and crew of Antiques Roadshow arrives in town, this is exactly what they find. And this is how the Tucson Convention Center looked last summer when they pulled into town on May 28, 2015. 48 hours later, it looked like this. <laughs> Welcome to a special edition of Arizona Illustrated, behind the scenes at Antiques Roadshow in Tucson. Hello, I'm Tom McNamara, and over the next 30 minutes, we'll reveal what it takes to create all of this from scratch. We'll also show you how three Roadshow episodes will emerge from all of this controlled chaos. You'll meet some of the appraisers and the crew, including the executive producer, Marsha Bemko and we'll relive one of the most cherished and astounding episodes in roadshow history, the Navajo Blanket. That now famous appraisal was shot right here in Tucson back in 2001. Roadshow returned here in 2007, which makes this the third time they've been here in Tucson. So what makes Tucson so special? Well, the people. <laughs> And we have found some very interesting items in Tucson, and that makes good television. And the excitement level is here, and the city is absolutely beautiful, and we're treated very, very well. Plus, you happen to be in a very convenient geographic location, and that is the truth of it. We, like, we have to tour across the country. We like to go west to east if we can, and uh, we need available convention center space. And then, of course, I remember the food. <laughs> Because <laughs> you always think about Tucson, great, I can't wait to get some food out there. <laughs> Nearly a year before the camera crews arrive, six cities are chosen. Roadshow advance staff visit each of them to work out logistics and collaborate with the local PBS station, like AZPM, to promote and staff the event. Then the heavy lifting begins. The trucks rolled in overnight, and today this huge empty space has to become a television studio for about 5,000 people overnight. This is the stuff people don't get to see. It takes us all day to get ready for Roadshow. It's like an oiled machine. Every city we go to, the truck comes in, we unload the truck, we have to put up the truss, all of the pieces that go, the cameras, etc. I mean, it's just a routine that we go through from city to city. We're like a family. It's a really tight-knit group. We all look forward to working with each other, but we also rely on each other, so there's a chemistry. We travel with about 55 staff and crew members. Then we pick up about 15 to 20 um, production people locally. And then we have 125 volunteers from the local area that will help us. So it's, and then 75 to 80 appraisers. It's a, it's a huge group. And let's see, where are we with the lighting truss? is not up, as you say. That lighting truss is really going to get high, but it has to get all set up. Raising the truss is when all the lighting fixtures and all the electronics and cables are actually in place. We have to make sure that everything's working before we actually take the truss up. But once the truss goes up, um, we're, we're in pretty good shape at that point. 12 feet, ready? One, two, three. Friday is really more of a setup day. We sort of go through our routine. But the challenge is on Saturday. We open up the doors, and then that's when the, the madness and the excitement all happens. I just hope that we see a lot of really good stories. I hope we get a, you know to meet a lot of people that get a chance to tell their story on TV. I can't imagine what's going to be here, but I can't wait to see. The set, lights, and camera equipment are tested and ready. The crew and appraisers are in place. And so, after months of preparation, production of the 20th season of Antiques Roadshow was about to begin. Or so we thought. A fire erupted on the set early Saturday morning. From the parking lot, things looked pretty dire. But the flames were quickly extinguished, the exhibit hall aired out and deemed safe, and just a few hours later, the road show was back on track.
It's early on a warm Saturday morning and people have come from all over Southern Arizona to have their items appraised and maybe, just maybe, appear on the show. I love the show and so I was like, this is, this is fun. I made up my mind one of these days, one of these years to get on your show and hopefully get an appraisal. We put in for the lottery for the tickets, saying what the heck, and we got two golden tickets. I got the pretty gold one here. The thought that maybe you had something that's really valuable that might be change your life. It's part of my religion, watching your show every week. When you receive a ticket, there's an entry time, any time between 8 and 5, and you're told to come, you know, not more than a half an hour before. Back in the day, when we first started, it was like you were waiting outside for a concert ticket. People would line up the night before. We find that people that come, they enjoy being in line with other people, making friends, sharing stories, talking about their items. I think my dad got this in uh, Gettysburg. So I don't know if it's used in the Civil War or if it was used in the Revolution or somewhere between. People have the opportunity to bring us two objects and they tend to pick the most two treasured things in their home. And the best advice I always have is pick something you can't Google. I think it's called a uh, mixed media and after that, I don't know what they call. That's what I'm hoping to find out today. I found a couple of auction listings for oil paintings, but they were nowhere near like this. And then that's it. That's where it all petered out. I have a very unusual cannon. It's from 1920. It shoots, what do you call those little balls, cannonballs, little tiny cannonballs. So I'm excited. I don't know anything about it. I know this after producing this show all these years. Great objects are rare. That is the tricky thing. Most of what we see will be worth less than, I'm going to be generous, $500. Do you care to unveil for us what you have here? Uh, show. Yeah. Mm. Do you know anything no, about it? No, nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> That's what we're here to find out today. This could be a wild card. It really could be. Yeah? We're excited though. Yeah. It's beautiful and it feels like it has vintage behind it. Yeah, we think yeah. so. This is... That looks serious. It is. Is there a train or a boat missing its lights today? <laughs> they are heavy. Wow. What do you know about them so far? We don't really know much. Uh, they're very complete. They're in pretty good condition. Are you here just to fiddle around today, or is this serious business? <laughs> no, I'm just fiddling around. Just <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the name Stradivarius printed anywhere? Uh, unfortunately, it's not a Stradivarius. <laughs> not looking for the million dollar uh, ticket, but... If it's here, that'll be nice too. Yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone in line here has, has got their fingers crossed that they're going to have that million dollar item that was a family heirloom. When we watch it on TV, if something's worth a lot of money, sell it. I'm hoping that um, it's worth $15,000 or $30,000. I'm already retired, but if it could enhance my retirement, I, I might. Depending on how big the number is. You know? So. <laughs> Depends, you know, if the price is right, though. All of a sudden, sentimentality might go out the window, huh? Oh, yeah. Grandma, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to part with them. <laughs> the day you sell it, you can't afford to buy it back. If you could find it. Myself, I think, oh my, I'd sell that in a heartbeat. I would. It wasn't my great great grandmother. All day long, people clutching their items snake towards and into the exhibit hall where they join hundreds of others, all still pondering potential wealth and, if so, whether or not to sell until they arrive at the first official stop in the roadshow appraisal process, the generalist table, or triage. Good morning, how are you? Hi, welcome to the Antiques Roadshow. Well, I don't know, tribal? Yeah, or... I'm, I'm thinking in that same, same ball game there. And then what else do you have? I'm scratching my head. It's also metal work. I think we're gonna start out with the collectibles table. Collectibles? Yeah. Here, an appraiser looks at each object and determines which of 24 categories it fits into, so a specialist can take a closer look. All right, thank you so much. Once you reach inside the auditorium with your item, you're met by a literal army of volunteers who are here to take you from what's called the triage area all the way over there in the background when you get into another line to meet the appraiser. 
So I'm going to send you over to this gentleman and he'll help you find your spot. Asian art should be a short line. Let's go over there. Okay. You want to do that? Yeah. Awesome. Maybe nice I'll find easy. out this is not Asian. <laughs> Once they get into the area where the set is, they stop and, you know, there's that moment of like, oh my gosh, this is what it looks like from the outside. Because when you're watching it on TV, you're just seeing that one focused area. But when you see the larger, you know, the iceberg beneath the surface, it's like, wow, this is a huge production. One of the keys to success for the Antiques Roadshow is the appraisers. Up to 70 of the country's top appraisers from the top auction houses are here, as well as nationally known independent dealers and appraisers, each with their own interests, backgrounds, and specialties. You can see this selling at auction for maybe close to $1,000. So. <laughs> there is no roadshow without the appraisers. They are the experts who can tell trash from treasure and turn family fables and high hopes to shock and awe or disappointment. Just going by the workmanship on this violin, it's not a real high quality instrument. So what does it take to be a good appraiser on the Antiques Roadshow? Honesty, friendliness, uh, a knowledge of an amazing amount of facts, obtuse, firm, you never know what's gonna to come to the table. I think you need to have a pretty good general knowledge because you never really know. I deal with paintings, and of course the history of art's a pretty extensive one, so if I just specialized in, I don't know, 18th century English watercolors, I probably wouldn't be doing a great deal. But fortunately, with the tables that we have and the appraisers, I think we complement each other quite well. So for example, if I don't do so much with old masters, I can talk to one of my colleagues and, and they, they can help out. A good appraiser, in many ways, is like a good doctor. I mean, you have to have some kind of a bedside manner, bedside etiquette. You, know, you can't just look at something and be like, that's nice, it's worth a dollar, thanks. I mean, you can do that, but that won't make you a good appraiser. Although it is sort of a business issue, when people have a collectible or they have a family heirloom, it's something that they've vested a lot of emotional energy into, and they have, they have to be treated as friends, not as you know, not as an arm's length business transaction. It's got a pretty look. What do you think it's worth? I have no idea. Uh, Two hundred bucks. Okay. As just a neat conversation done, it's probably worth in the four to five hundred dollar range. Oh, terrific. It's got that much pretty in it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys coming out today. Okay. Thank you for your patience. Four or five hundred bucks. After you know, waiting in line and talking to everybody else, they come around and they come up to us and they go, what can you tell me about this? He's from 1950. Oh, from 1950. But he's, he's in the style of the mid 16th century. You feel kind of a weight of responsibility because these people are coming to you for your advice and your knowledge. They came here to see you. James Supp is an Antiques Roadshow appraiser who works in collectibles. I enjoy helping people understand that what they have is maybe important and maybe valuable or may not and sometimes I'll have to tell them that it has no real value and some of these people are just so thankful because now they can get rid of it. But really the important part about it is our connection with those items and the story behind the items themselves. That is a modern nail that's been hammered in place probably at some later time. An appraiser is essentially like a detective. When we're looking through this stuff we're trying to find out more about it, trying to find out what story the object tells us. Um, because these are two pieces of dome sheet steel. Yeah. So I'm looking to see is, it, was it forge welded? Was it soldered? And that's a great way to help determine the age on it. Who's James Supp? Well, he's a local boy. If you see a big handle mar bar mustache walking down the street, stop and ask him, is, is that you, James? Or is there a lot of that here in Tucson? I don't know. <laughs> For James, having the road show in Tucson makes things a little easier. He was born and raised in the old Pueblo which is great that they're coming to my hometown, makes it so I don't have to you know, sit on an airplane for several hours and get a hotel room. I can just go out there, be bright and shiny, and appraise immediately. And I'm so excited about getting to see all these people, local people for a change, and be able to see what kind of treasures they're going to bring in and find out what kind of cool things Tucson has hidden away. The appraisers are well-respected experts in their field and celebrities on the road, but they don't exactly get the red carpet treatment. 
they pay their own way here, they pay for their own hotel rooms, they pay their own expenses. We give them lunch and breakfast on Saturday, plus about nine and a half million viewers a week. We've changed their lives. It's hard to monetize what it's worth, but the Roadshow is a number of things. It's great publicity, it's great recognition, it gives us great credibility. We all have day jobs. I run an auction house in New York City. Other appraisers have galleries, uh, auction houses of their own. James runs his own appraisal and conservation business out of Tucson. But for him, one of the draws of being a Roadshow appraiser is the company of his fellow appraisers. And I get to work on the collectibles table, surrounded by some of the best personalities in the business. It always amazes me how much knowledge that they have in so many different areas. These great appraisers who love teaching, love talking, and love people. Many roadshow appraisers are sporting their own look with ponytails, bow ties, and the occasional mustache. One furry-faced friend who's given James a run for his money, Nicholas Lowry. He has got that evil uh, ringmaster thing going on, which is so contrary to his character. He is just such a great guy. He's got this wonderful little black mustache and he looks like a ringmaster. It's wonderful. He has the whole Mephistophelian thing going. He's got the mustache, he's got the beard. It's sort of like Lenin meets Lucifer. He is sort of the gold standard, the paragon of facial hair among roadshow appraisers. And the rest of us strive to sort of keep up with him uh, vainly. By day's end, Antiques Roadshow appraisers will have met with upwards of two to 300 guests. And each one of them has their own magical, wonderful story. My colleagues and I, we always try to think about, these people are here for us, but the only reason we're here is because of them. Approximately 1,000 objects are appraised each and every hour. For those who've made it this far, it's the moment they've been waiting for. I don't know anything about it except it's really, really heavy. It's a wonderful decorative piece. To a collector, it's not a full-size gun. So, we got the entire roadshow work for the auction estimate today. Would be something in the range of two to three thousand or twenty-five percent. Really, for all of that work and everything. They'll usually sell anywhere from that two to four hundred dollars. Darn it! I was hoping for the big money. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's they can't say we didn't try. You know what? It looks really nice on my dresser. That's good of the thousands of objects appraised at each event, approximately 150 are recorded for broadcast or web. About 60 will appear on the Antiques Roadshow. Behind the scenes, in the midst of all the hustle and bustle, Antiques Roadshow staff are hyper-focused at finding those special items that will make it to the show. It sounds like a full episode. They're the ones who will go around and listen to the appraisers pitch an object. Most people who come in tomorrow are going to find out, let's say they bring in a glass. They're going to learn that their wine glass is circa 2010 and it's worth $5 to $10. It's used to hold liquid, usually wine. Do you have any other questions? It's done. The appraisal's over. But let's say you brought in the golden goblet, okay, instead of that. Instead, the appraiser's going to say, would you wait for a producer? I think we, I think we can make it work, but we go. It's the producers who determine if the appraisal should be recorded for broadcast. And I want, do you have an appraisal on the camera? Okay. I think it's such a great story. I can't talk to anybody about it now. Okay. Until we get the camera <laughs> Now it's TV time. Norm, have a great time. Be yourself, you're gonna do great. The lucky guests are escorted to one of four on-camera appraisal sites. All of the careful pre-production work that took place yesterday is now paying off as each set is pre-lit and ready to roll. Those chosen for an on-camera appraisal have been told nothing about their object or its possible value. The first time they learn anything is when the camera is already rolling. Well, I have to keep my poker face on and I can't smile or I can't sort of start drooling or rubbing my hands. <laughs> it's a nice and easy you have. I want to break. You can't do that as much as you'd like. So you really have to keep it cool. So yeah, it really depends what comes in.
all the thousands of appraisals that have been done on the Antiques Roadshow, there is one that is seared in the memory of fans and show staff alike, and it was shot right here in Tucson, the Navajo Blanket. I guess we're all interested in acquiring stuff that's old and you know, just want to know where we came from, I guess. Ted Koontz has been acquiring stuff that's old for a very long time. Like this one probably paid around forty dollars for it back in uh, fifty three, fifty now well, about fifty six or fifty seven. But Ted is best known for one item in his collection. This one. When you walked in with this, I just about died. On a really bad day, this textile would be worth. $350,000. On a good day, it's about a half a million dollars. Oh my God. Ted's Navajo blanket made Antiques Roadshow history as one of the most valuable objects ever appraised on the show. It had spent years draped over a chair in Ted's bedroom, a relic of his childhood. I lived with my grandparents when my folks were separated when I was five years old. And uh, my grandmother had grown up with this uh, frontiersman, uh, Mark Bedell, and the story goes that Kit Carson gave this blanket to Mark Bedell. It was a young boy, uh, six, seven, eight, nine years old. During the years I was living with my grandmother, it was on the bed where I slept. And in the cold winter days, it was probably thrown over me. Once Ted learned the blanket's value, he knew he couldn't keep it. It would be better served to be someplace where it could be preserved properly. It was sold to an anonymous buyer who donated it or put it at the Detroit Institute of the Arts in, in, in Detroit. And so far as I know, it's still there on display three or four months a year. I stopped by Detroit on a trip back in 98, or 08, 08. And they had just taken it out and uh, put it back in storage and I didn't get to see it there, but I was hoping to. With the money from the blanket sale, Ted and his wife, Virginia, were able to buy their home and help family and friends. But otherwise, life stayed pretty much the same. I worked up until I was 74 years old. I, I had, had no intention of changing my lifestyle. Our wedding picture. Now, the Navajo blanket and provides the Kuntzes with a safety net for medical expenses and hard times. Well, I've gone blind, pretty much totally blind. I can see to get around, so I'm totally dependent on somebody to drive me any place I want to go. and. Uh, help do a lot of things that I took for granted in my younger years that I could no longer do. I, so I have to sit back in the easy chair taking care of my wife. Care is expensive. <laughs> it, it does add up. But despite his difficulties, Ted Kuntz still finds joy in collecting bits and pieces of history just in case take care of the old things and someday they'll be valuable. You never know what's going to produce value. It's extremely rare. It is the most important thing that's coming. Almost out. unbelievable that I could have something that valuable. This is just pure linear design. Surprise of my life. <laughs> I had no idea. I was just laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Gee. Throughout the day, hopeful Tucsonans continue to approach appraisers, while most go home learning that their collectible painting or keepsake isn't going to make them rich. They all leave knowing a little more about it, and they share a memory they wouldn't trade for the world. I don't know if it's going to pay my, for my brand new car yet, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> it ended up being from a Hungarian artist. It's about, uh, what do you say, from the 1940s? And what did he appraise it at? Between three and five hundred dollars. Bit better than nothing. Bye bye. Come back to Tucson. At least I know something about the gun. 
Uh, four to five hundred bucks, a lot more than I thought it would be. I, you know, I wasn't expecting a million, but open. I had so much fun. My sister and I, we were just going through the lines. Everyone loved the cannon. They asked to take pictures of the cannon. Oh no, it was a pretty good day. By the end of the day, in every city they visit, the crew will have captured enough appraisals to produce three shows. Then they'll spend the fall, winter, and spring editing, screening, and re-editing a season's worth of episodes, all the while making plans for the next season of the Antiques Roadshow. Watching the incredibly syncopated yet personal process that is the Antiques Roadshow is like watching an orchestra perform on a 90,000 square foot stage. 5,000 people with up to 10,000 items to be appraised. And what started out early this morning won't be finished until 7.30 or 8.30 in the evening. And while even then it'll still look pretty much like this by tomorrow afternoon. The Antiques Roadshow is off to another city. Thank you for watching this special edition of Arizona Illustrated. See you soon. Tucson, thanks. It's been a great weekend. Had a super time. Toodaloo, Tucson. <laughs> Thank you so much for your warm welcome, and I hope we'll be back again soon. Thank you, Tucson. Goodbye. Goodbye, Tucson. We'll be back. You're hot, Tucson. But we enjoy it anyway, okay? Thanks for having us here at PBS GBH in Boston. See you again soon. Rocha. Take care. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Bye-bye.